This week on The Travel Show, we're in Tokyo, hosts of the 2020 Paralympics, finding out what it'll be like for disabled visitors traveling to the city. No elevator, so I'm just gonna have to brave the stairs. Also coming up, catching waves at Hawaii's adaptive surf school. And traveling with autism, how one family prepares for their first flight together. So instead of patting them down, they put this little solution on them. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. First up, we're off to Tokyo, where thousands of disabled athletes and spectators will show up for the 16th Summer Paralympic Games in 2020. Paul Carter has gone to find out how the city is preparing. Tokyo, a sprawling metropolis where historic monuments rest alongside futuristic skyscrapers. My name's Paul Carter, I'm a journalist, and this is my first time in Tokyo. I've come here to see what life is like for disabled people not only visiting here, but also who call this place their home. I was born without any lower arms or legs, and as you can probably see, I use um, short prosthetics to get around. So I'm just off to try and find something to eat. Obviously it does pose some challenges, particularly with my height. Anywhere with high stalls like this is actually out of bounds to me. And in terms of fatigue, I can't walk for, for very long distances. Sometimes people see me and have a perception of who I am and what I might be able to do and what my limitations are. And I don't always think that their perceptions necessarily meet my Reality. One food that's always a particular challenge at home is soup. But here it's not considered rude to drink from the bowl, so bon appetit. I'm in the most populated city in the world, and I'm heading to its tallest tower, the Sky Tree, to see what Tokyo looks like from on high. This modern icon was built in 2012 and stands at a whopping 634 metres high. Oh, that is just popped. I'm told it can withstand earthquakes up to seven magnitude, as well as handle some 10,000 visitors a day. It looks like a Lego cityscape. It doesn't look real. I think what you get up here is just a sense of not only scale of how massive this place is, but how, how densely populated it is, how everything's so tightly packed together. I think usually on a clear day, you're supposed to be able to see Mount Fuji in the, in the distance, but I think the weather gods haven't smiled on us today. Me and tall things don't usually go together, to be honest with you, but um, it's actually nice to feel like I'm looking down on something for once. You can't come to the Sky Tree Tower and not have your photo taken. Oh my God. I've just realised there's a, gla a glass floor. Oh, that makes me feel a little bit sick. Oh. <laughs> I really don't like it. I love it. It's got my best side. That was so cool. But you know, if you can cope with the crowds, it's fairly easy to get around. Could have done without the glass floor, to be honest with you. Um, not the biggest fan of heights. Didn't realise that was there. Um, but no. Absolutely cracking fun, really good place to come. But away from the modernity, I wanted to find out how Tokyo's historic monuments measure up for accessibility. Canadian-born Josh has lived here for more than a decade and runs a website offering advice to disabled visitors. Let's go. I don't know where to look first. Yeah, there's so many. There's more sites in the back. Sites everywhere. Sensoji is Tokyo's oldest and most famous temple. It was founded in the 7th century, but rebuilt after the Second World War. Uh, the building's not original anymore. Of I was going to say, yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't look 1400 <laughs> years old. It looks pretty good for 1400, yeah. <laughs> um, but one of the things I think is most impressive about this place is that they've done a lot to make it wheelchair accessible. Okay. And, uh, but they have done it in a way that doesn't uh, affect the general feeling of the place. Mm. That's the lift. The elevator. That's the lift, yeah. And it's, it's well hidden, so actually a lot of people didn't know where it was, so they had to put a sign on it. 
As we enter the main pagoda, I start to take in some of the traditions of Japanese Buddhist culture. So what's happening over here? People throwing Yeah, they're money making in? Uh, they're making prayers. First thing that strikes me about this is just the, the scale of it. It's it's much bigger than I was expecting and it's it's a lot more for want of a better word, gold. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Everyone here seems very deferential and it's quite a sense of reverence in here. Yeah, yeah it's very important to the soul of people in Japan. Yeah. In the past 10 years, 11 years since you've been here, have you seen things change? Yes, for sure. Um, for example, along with the infrastructure improvements, I think people's attitudes have also began to change a lot more. Um, before, there'd be barely anybody else out in a wheelchair, and so you'd get strange looks and stuff like that. But um, you know, as people are being able, able to go out more often, they are going out more often, and because of that, people around them are getting more used to you know, the different colors of society. And um, you know, with the Olympics coming up soon, I think it's getting even better. So far, I've been genuinely impressed by the efforts that have been made to improve access to the city's tourist attractions. But what's it like getting around? I'm told that the subway system is 80 to 90% wheelchair accessible, so in theory, travel should be fairly straightforward. Is this the entrance? Is there a way with, no, with an elevator? No elevator. So I'm just going to have to brave the stairs because I don't know where the elevator is. Exit, toilets, information. Let's see if the power of translation apps can help find a lift. Ah, down, downstairs. Okay. Okay, thank you. So there isn't an elevator on this floor. So it's stairs again. Shibuya's new subway station was designed over three levels with lots of steps. There are lifts and escalators, but there's a lack of information and I had to walk long distances to find them. There's a sign there for a train. Okay, this looks more like it. First challenge is the button that says international languages is too high for me to reach. Can I buy a ticket? Hands on on station. It looks like this cat is going to help me. At least I think so. Okay. I have no idea if I'm actually in the right place, but we'll soon find out. By the time I reach the platform on the bottom level, I'm pretty tired. But it seems I'm not the only one. Even locals are confused by the signage. How do you find it access-wise using the subway? Eventually, I reach my destination. Aha, we made it to a side street. Oh well, we sort of got there. I'm curious about current attitudes to disabilities here in Japan. There are over six million people registered disabled in this country, and I'm off to an event where non-disabled people get to find something out about what life is like for them. Yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about what's, uh, what's going on here in this. In this booth, we have a uh... Parasports awareness event that we have a lot of like different uh, parasports. You can try out anything you want. It's hoped that events like this will not only educate the public in how to behave around people with disabilities, but actually change society. People treat me like a special person. Yeah. You know, I'm a person with impairment, but I'm not a special person. <laughs> We, well, Parasports has a power to change the society. And Paralympics has a power to change the society. So it's been changing little by little, and these two years going to drive uh, changing the uh, society really fast. This is, all looks really great. Yes, would you like to try some? Go on then, let's give it a crack. Yes. <laughs> Are you ready? Okay. I don't think so, but okay. Oh! <laughs> Oh, 
was that was genuinely terrifying. It's quite refreshing to see so many people engaging with the with the events and with the trials. I must admit, I was a little bit cynical about this kind of thing coming into it. Non-disabled people doing para sport. Sometimes it's a bit it's a bit naff, but. Actually, you know what? People were really engaging with it, and if that's what it takes to expose people to this kind of sport and to engage with disability, then I guess it's only a good thing. Still to come on The Travel Show, we meet the twins with autism about to embark on their first family holiday. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. So stick with us for that. Welcome to Trend in Travel, your rundown of the best travel stories, pics and clips happening online. And this month, we're focusing on the world of disabled travel. One sport making its debut at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics is surfing. But disabled surfers are still waiting for their chance to compete at the Paralympics. Here in Hawaii, one of the world's top surfing destinations, an organisation called Access Surf helps people of all abilities to catch some waves. Adaptive surfing is a term that means that either the equipment or how the person surfs has been modified. There's a lot of different ways that people can surf and get back into the water. Prone surfing, they're in a lay down position. They might have um, a bit of a ramp on their board, like for their chest or some handles. There's also something that's called a wave ski. So the surfer is sitting on top of the surfboard and they have a paddle. And then of course there's also stand surfing. The word we hear all the time, why it's so important, is freedom. It's true empowerment, you know. And yes, we are definitely working towards hopefully the Paralympics. The ISA, which is the International Surfing Association, and programs like Access Surf, we're all helping build the sport of competitive adaptive surfing. Take my word for it, camping in a wheelchair can be an absolute nightmare. It's not my idea of fun. I'm more of a hotel person myself. But a company based out of the UK claims to have the solution, the Omnipod. It's a luxury prefab with extra space, ramps, and a specially adapted kitchen and washroom. And the manufacturer claims all it takes is a single day to install. A few have gone up already, and it's hoped that these pods could help open up the great outdoors as well as Britain's many summer festivals. Thanks to all of you that have got in touch about the challenges that you've faced on your travels. We've asked some of the internet's top disability travel bloggers for their favourite trips and tips for anyone wanting to follow them around the world. Ed Rex is a profoundly deaf traveller who has ticked off six continents in just seven years. The biggest issue I probably face is awareness. Whether it's a tour company, planes, buses, trains, um, or even you know fellow travellers on the road. And it's not their fault really, because they need to be educated. And that's what the deaftraveller.com is all about. When you come to another country and nobody knows exactly what your disability is, it's your chance to uh, educate them what your disability is and what you should expect of the other person to treat you how you want to be treated. While transatlantic duo Sophie and Beth run Our Adaptive World, a website about travelling with their wheelchairs. The single best travel experience I've had, I think has to be the first time I went out to Colorado to learn how to ski. I was really apprehensive, but it was really the first time following my spinal cord injury when I realised what was possible with a disability. And of course, I met my blogging partner, Beth, too. Don't forget to share your adventures with us at BBC Travel Show. Now, travelling with kids can be pretty stressful at the best of times, but the sights and sounds of going on a plane can be even more overwhelming for some children with autism. Over the next two weeks, we're following the Ellis family and their autistic four-year-old boys, Alex and Will, as they go on their very first holiday. Let's head over to America to meet them. I'm Amber and my husband is Frank. We live outside of Birmingham, Alabama. 
we have four beautiful boys. Frankie, who is 17, Stephen, who is 14, and then we have a set of boy twins who are four years old, and they are nonverbal autistic. Their names are Alex and Will. <laughs> We are the Ellis family. <laughs> My husband and I have known each other since grade school, and we were friends the whole time. We dated in high school and married in college, and this is our 20th wedding anniversary. Because we have some issues with the boys, we have not been on a trip in a really long time. They're not very effective at communication, so it takes a lot of intuition to figure out what they need. We have a lot of meltdowns. And then when there are two autistic nonverbal children, the behaviors can be exponential. Sometimes they play off of each other. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. We've had a lot of emotional turmoil in the past year. We've recently lost some family members and have had some grief. We started talking about taking a trip. How should we do it? This is our 20th anniversary. <laughs> we have come through so much as a family that we wanted to go as a family and just enjoy each other. <laughs> so we felt like it was time to go on a trip. All right, so I'm gonna take one, two, three, four. It's taken us a long time to come to the point where we were ready. We've never flown with the twins before, so we're kind of nervous and excited about getting on a plane. Okay, so let's do each. Because they're autistic nonverbal, they function on about the level of an 18 month old. So they're a lot of work. A few years ago, we went to the beach for a couple of days together, um, but they were very small. This will give us a good sense of how, how it will be and what we can expect for future longer trips. Okay, how are we gonna do an airplane? Somebody's always gotta take care of one of the twins, another person has to take care of the other one, and then who's gonna take care of all of the things that we take with us? What all do, do we need to take? Seven. What snacks are we gonna have? Let's see, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Do we take the blankies? Do we take toys? Do we need to take the iPad? Things to keep them entertained, and then, are we gonna have meltdowns? If they melt down, how do we deal with the people around us? How do we let them know that it's really okay? And that we're actually okay with meltdowns. We just have to kind of help keep them calm and try to soothe them as much as possible. Because you worry about the people around you that you're offending people or uh, and you worry about being judged. Look how handsome you are! <laughs> Just to know that somebody understands is so helpful. And you all of a sudden don't feel so crazy. They're autistic, so they have come with their own needs, you know? So we are going to take the whole family for the first time to a special park called Wonderland in San Antonio, Texas. It's a special needs park and they have lots of fun things for specifically special needs children, very wheelchair accessible. There's a lot of different ways it could go, you know, with their, their very strict routines that they have to have going outside of that a little bit will stress them a little bit and you just kind of have to roll with it. So. I'm looking forward to it primarily because it's a new thing that we haven't done before so it's kind of just like challenge accepted. Let's do it. <laughs> That's the fun for him is let's do this. Let's see if we can accomplish it. So it's just his personality but <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I've played too many strategy games. <laughs> Everything is pretty ready. We'll just have a nice quiet evening finishing up any last details and then we'll be ready for tomorrow. So we are going to fly out of Birmingham and fly to Houston. 
The flight from Birmingham to Houston is a relatively short flight. It's only two hours. From there, we will rent a truck or some kind of vehicle and drive the rest of the way to San Antonio. Please present ticket to exit. Thank you. Okay, I might be getting a little nervous now because we're at the airport and we're pulling into the parking deck. So it's really real. We're going to do it. Okay. Frank um, Sr., Frank Jr., Stephen, Alex, Alex, you, me, and Will. Will. Yay! Look at that lens. Got it? <laughs> Here, take more time to look at the lens. Ready? It's kind of a healing time for our family. It's redemptive. We can go on this trip together. Good? The older boys have such a sweet dynamic with the little boys. Is yeah, that okay? Try, yeah, okay. Try it so instead of patting them down, they right, put this little solution on them. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Here, let's do it. But two toddlers is difficult. Ready to start riding? Well, when you add nonverbal autistic, it just makes it exponential. I always feel this sense to like rush and get everything packed. We have plenty of time. And so I kind of have to emotionally prepare myself. I'm so relieved that that part is over. <laughs> now let's just get to the gate. Kind of carry that anxiety in the back of your mind of how is it gonna go? Just kind of be ready to roll with the punches. Whatever happens, just be ready for anything. And we'll find out how the family get on next week as they head to that theme park in America designed for children with special needs. While Carmen spends 90 minutes in Nagoya in Japan, Ooh. attempting to see three of the city's highlights in the time it takes to watch a rugby match. Well, I'm definitely in the right place. Nagoya Castle, and my time starts now. Okay, well, that's your lot for this week. And don't forget, you can keep up with all our travels online. But for now, from me, Adia Depitan, and all the travel show team here at London's Olympic Park, it's bye-bye.